Welcome to TTT Limited, I'm DK Rostar. Trinidad and Tobago hosted a regional symposium addressing crime and violence as a public health issue on April 17 and 18. While you can watch or rewatch the entire two days on TTT's online platforms, we did a roundup of some of those stories over the span of the symposium. We also included some clips by other individuals. Now, in offering welcome remarks, Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, Dr. Carla N. Barnett, said that violence in the region is an epidemic, and like any epidemic, effective strategies to combat the spread requires data, research, as well as human and financial resources to allow timely implementation of solutions to address the root cause of crime and mitigate the devastating impact of crime and violence in our society. Prime Minister of the Bahamas and the Chair of the Caribbean Community, or CARICOM, Philip Davis, KC, said that violence spreads like a virus. It is contagious. It can strike and grow exponentially. Persons who are in contact or close contact with violence are most likely to spread it and become victims to it. He continued that violence is contagious and those who map the commission of violent crimes find that their data mirrors the spread of infectious diseases within a community. In our first news item in this roundup, a letter from CARICOM will soon be sent to Washington asking for the U.S. government to stem or stop the flow of illegal guns and ammunition to the Caribbean. Sunalala tells us more. We want the guns and ammunition stopped. Prime Minister Dr. Kate Rowley said CARICOM leaders have signed a communique coming out of the regional symposium aimed at the United States to intervene in the illegal trade of weapons. He said the unregulated illegal flow of guns and ammunition continues to wreak havoc in the Caribbean and believes U.S. intervention could significantly solve the major elements of weapons flowing in the region. And we will take equivalent action in our country for that which slips through. But we want to see the borders, both there and here, so secured that it will become difficult for that kind of business to so easily wreak this kind of havoc on Caribbean societies. The letter, he said, will soon be sent to the United States and is confident it will be taken seriously by officials in Washington. That letter will go to Washington and I have every confidence that the United States President and his administration will understand the pain that we are feeling and we're backing it up with evidence. Dr. Rowley said CARICOM will also take measures internally to ensure the limited use of weapons. CARICOM heads are agreeing today to take a decision as we've done to ban the use and presence of assault weapons in the civilian population of our nations. Dr. Rowley also called on opposition parties in the various territories to support legislation to deal with crime, noting that the issues should be of the wider national interest rather than for political benefit. Sonolala, TTT News. Prime Minister of Grenada said social media needs to be used to reverse the social norm that says violence is okay. While the Honorable Andrew Michael Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica, said that violence is now a normalized tool of social interaction. Regional security ministers shared their findings and successes during the second day of the Caribbean Community's Regional Symposium on Violence as a public health issue, the crime challenge. Terry Ann Brown Campbell has the story. Minister with Responsibility for Crime Prevention in Barbados, Corey Lane, noted the island conducted a national survey which revealed their version of the SEA examination is a contributing factor to their rising crime rates. How many students that we've damaged by putting them through that particular format of education, where we've taken off the cream of the crop, and we've said to them that they've done well, they're important, they're successful, and a whole other set of generations of young people have been told not that you fail an exam, but that you are a failure. Meanwhile, Jamaica's Justice Minister Delroy Chuck said restorative justice is working to help them address their crime issues. 
To put it into perspective, in 2021 and 2022, 4,460 cases were referred to RJ by the courts. 3,904 cases were satisfactorily resolved, which oftentimes means the charges are withdrawn or the offenders admonished and discharged. And Trinidad and Tobago's National Security Minister, Fitzgerald Hines, indicated results are positive from the mediation and other intervention programs. Well, at the YTRC, the Youth Training and Rehabilitation Center, we have seen a significant drop in the number of persons who come there. So that tells me that there is some diversion and that they are being dealt with in the family and children's division with the many, many, many range of options available to those who practice and administer there. The regional symposium ended on Tuesday with regional heads of state, non-governmental organizations, the private sector and civil society having had an opportunity to air their views and solutions on the region's crime problems. Terry Ann Brown Campbell, TTC News. Thank you, Terry Ann. We continue with the words of Prime Minister Rowley, lead head with responsibility for energy and security. He said, we remind you that the Caribbean's strength is in its union and weakness is in its discord. The region cannot afford to lose the war on crime, end quote. Now, in a round-table discussion, the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, said rotate magistrates across the region to get a more transparent judicial system. Collective responsibility is within the fabric of our culture and it can be reinvigorated as we reimagine and plot our onward course for the betterment of all. The issue of violence is one that is critical to our collective survival as a region. Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, said that I cannot accept that crime is a result of economic issues. Now, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, says that regional heads of government need to cooperate to address the scourge of crime in the Caribbean. Terry Ann Brown Campbell is there with a story. Noting that since the Treaty of Chagaramas was signed decades ago, security is the only pillar that has been added to the regional treaty in the last 20 years. Prime Minister of Barbados, Maya Motley, said there are several areas for cooperation. Why are we all putting money separately and individually in forensic labs? Two, why are we not doing and pooling training? Because most police services in this region do not have enough forensic people the judges, we need to start rotating the use of judges and magistrates in the region to ensure that there is not the familiarity with counsel and other circumstances and, and, and the things that people take for granted. Meanwhile, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, said there's a small minority of society which has chosen a life of crime. Those who are in the Boy Scouts, the Cadet Corps, play steel band, play football, play cricket, get involved in community activities, go to church, all of these various things. You hardly see any of them in front of the magistrate or the judge. The regional heads of state made their comments as they participated in a panel discussion on regional crime. Terry Ann Brown Campbell, TTC News. In terms of looking at violence as a public health issue, the crime challenge, Dr. David Allen, psychiatrist and consultant, Office of the Minister of the Bahamas, said that a hurt child is a dangerous adult, and guns are the new drugs. Dr. Robin Sinanon, Ministry of Health of Trinidad and Tobago, said database and advocacy works. Also representing the TNT Ministry of Health, Dr. Hazel Othello, said that mental illness does not mean violent crime. However, it does suggest that there is an increased risk for violence associated with certain types of mental disorders. CARICOM leaders met on Monday to discuss violence as a public health issue. The two-day regional crime symposium is being hosted by the government of Trinidad and Tobago at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Port of Spain. Terry Ann Brown has more in this report. Crime and the consequences of crime are devastating the region. This from Chairman of CARICOM and Prime Minister of the Bahamas, Philip Davis. Prime Minister Davis noted, more than a dozen murders are being committed in the region daily. On a typical day, some estimates suggest that an average of 13 young adults 
between the ages of 16 to 30 lose their lives to violent crime in our region. Meanwhile, Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, CARICOM's head with responsibility for energy and security, highlighted the consequences of crime on our societies. Violence in the Caribbean is a public health emergency which threatens our lives, our economies, our national security, and by extension, every aspect of our well-being. Dr. Rowley indicated the local murder rate climbed to above 600 in 2022, a new record for this country. In Trinidad and Tobago, in the years 2011 to 2022, we have lost and have had to grieve for 5,439 lives lost violent murder, largely through the use of imported firearms and ammunition. The two-day regional symposium on violence as a public health issue, the Crime Challenge, began at the Hyatt Regency on Monday. Terry Ann Brown Campbell, TTT News. Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, believes the region needs to revisit and discuss the issue of the death penalty. Sunalala has more. St. Vincent Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez turned heads on Monday when he called for the return of the death penalty in the region. On the opening day of the Regional Crime Symposium, Dr. Gonzalez said he was raised as a Roman Catholic and taught that the death penalty was unjust, but said he believes it should be something that is considered again in the region to deter crime. Most of the people who do killing, they are cowards. Never mind this macho thing which you see they may present. They are absolute cowards. And if we have that as a particular option in the punishment schedule and for the courts not to make it very well, well nigh impossible to carry out the death penalty. Dr. Gonzalez also made the point that the courts have been too lenient on criminals. Too many of our judges and our magistrates are too soft. Sometimes you get the impression that some magistrates Depending on who is the lawyer, their people seem to get a better treatment, their clients. Everybody talks about this, you know, but they talk about it behind closed doors. He called for territories to update its legislation to enforce stricter laws, noting that a discussion needs to happen now. How can you go and give up somebody who is charged for murder bail? Let's, let's be serious. Uh, how can you do that? Huh? I saw in the, the numbers from the Bahamas. Where those judges live? On Mars? Sonalala, TTT News. Meanwhile, an advocate for human rights says the death penalty continues to be a knee-jerk reaction to rising crime, pointing out that it has been historically used regionally. Sonalala has the details. Co-chairman of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights, Dr. Carolyn Gomez, says the death penalty remains absolutely useless in curbing crime. Speaking at a UWI panel discussion on Monday, she noted that the topic has been thrown around for decades by government officials in the region rather than fixing the main issues. Almost in an immediate response at a suggestion by St. Vincent Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez for the region to consider the death penalty, Dr. Gomez said the death penalty has not served to deter crime in any way with this the last thing on the minds of criminals. People who are committing murders aren't thinking about whether they will be um, facing death penalty in 20 or 25 years. They're, they're thinking about, if they're thinking about anything, and it's not a heat of passion thing, they're thinking about the likelihood of being caught. So how you respond to violent crime is to improve your the people's chances of being caught. Um, and that requires a whole, that's a whole nother topic, a whole nother day. Um, that requires a lot of change to our systems of policing, which are remain colonial. She said those in higher authority need to look at the grassroots problems that create crime, along with improving the detection and conviction rate. We've not strengthened the police force's abilities to work with communities. And there are a number of reports, some out of Trinidad. There was a bipartisan report done when Mr. Pandey was prime minister. That's hard to tell you how many years ago that was and many out of Jamaica, all of which suggest a deepening of engagement with the causes, education, social, <clears throat> um, all of the other things, socioeconomic factors, bad schooling. 
Dr. Gomez pointed out that there have been numerous studies throughout the years to curb crime, none of which focuses on reinstituting the death penalty, since it simply doesn't work. Sonolala, TTT News. The University of the West Indies was represented by Dr. Randy Sipasad, who spoke to the economic perspective on crime and violence, saying that the cost of crime goes far beyond the economics of crime. The cost of crime is psychological and social. It affects the healthcare system and also affects communities and families. Time now for some of the question and answer segment that took place on the second day. And uh, I've been a principal there for roughly 20 years. And around, during that time, in about 2001, 2002, we embarked on a violence reduction program. So we started to gather data on, you know, why? Why is this happening? But coming from the outside, I got a shock when I went in there. But there are some things I want to mention. One of the things specific to violence that we have found over our observations and reflections on data, and we do have an extensive database of findings and conclusions. One of the things that we saw is that the way masculinity is constructed in the gang communities is much different from how we see it from the outside. One of the shortcomings, we think, from the, well, I could speak now because I'm no longer a sitting principal. Uh, I think I'm free. I'm, Trusting that the Prime Minister won't be upset with me, <laughs> our Honourable Prime Minister. But um, <laughs> one of the things we understand is that we on the outside, we see things a particular way that may be very different from how people see it outside. And violence that we saw, what we see is violence is one of those markers of masculinity. The boys aspire to it, the girls subscribe to it and submit to it. That's what we have seen. I didn't hear that yesterday. Um, I know the research has been done, but we have been operating on the ground in that community. So I would have noted the recommendations made by our NPTA representative this morning. And it pleases me to say that, you know, I feel that we are ahead of the game as the TTPS, that is the organization that I represent. We have incorporated both suppression and preventative measures to treat with all of those recommendations that you highlighted. Some of those were mentioned yesterday by our commissioner. We have the Police Youth Clubs project Grace, which is doing assessments. We have the Community Conflict Resolution Center, which is using ADR in conflict resolution and anger management and capacity building at the school and community level. These, along with all of our other existing programs and ministry initiatives, I agree there is need for more, there is need for improvement. But my question this morning to you, Ms. Representative of the NPTA, I would really like to know what has been done or what is in the pipeline to come from your organization specifically as it relates to the issue of parenting because we all are aware that the root cause, and we keep using the term root cause, the root cause of some of our worst violent crime starts in the home. What is in place for the capacity building of our parents where the core of our issues, where juvenile delinquency, um, deviant behavior, and all of these issues that we're here discussing, what is your organization doing or is prepared to do to really address this growing pandemic of poor parenting across our nation? Thank you for the question. We're going to feel the other two before we pause. Sir? I give thanks to be here today to be at this symposium having spent over 50 years on the street actually dealing and seeing what is actually the root causes of crime over the years. As pertaining to listening to the panel who speaks about the education, about the youths, um, you all were very good, very good, very um, touching on many, many, many points. I listened to the, um, the lady who spoke about the different, um, what the work of the parent parent teachers are doing and all of that, which is it's, it's quite good. These initiatives are very good once they, are be, once they are become action plan. But the truth of the fact of the matter over the years that I have noticed 
is a, how shall I, a leadership slash management problem. Now I heard you make a statement that disturbed me. You must not disturb me. About forgiveness and restorative justice. Yes. Now as I understand it, and let me confess, I, 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 I have been trained by the Restorative Justice Network in New Zealand and the International Institute in um, Pennsylvania, Bethlehem. And I always understood that forgiveness is not a part of it. If it happens, fine. But the danger of putting forgiveness in there is that sometimes it produces the result that you don't want, that people are going to say, I do not forgive this perpetrator, but I want him to hear what he has done to me. Because what restorative justice is, is going to be doing is involving the victims and the offenders and members of the community in trying to repair the harm. So forgiveness sometimes would preclude people, you know, coming and doing it at all. So if you would withdraw that statement, I would be very happy. <laughs> and um, I, 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 I don't necessarily believe that forgiveness is a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. But I think you will appreciate that it helps. Because to the extent that the offender has been persuaded to accept responsibility, Mm -hmm. then to that extent, you really try to urge the victim understand for there to be restoration, there must be a mutual understanding of what we are trying to achieve. So that if there isn't an understanding of what caused the offense, then the ultimate goal of restoration may not, um, may not happen. So I do agree that you're right. I mean, forgiveness is not a precondition, mm -hmm. but it helps. If it occurs, we're happy, but it doesn't have to be there. No, I accept that. Thank you very much, sir. You've made me happy. <clears throat> In providing a roundup of the symposium, Minister of Foreign and Caricom Affairs, Senator Dr. Amy Brown, had a conversation on the Now Morning Show. We share some of that with you now. This symposium has been in formulation for some time. Uh, coming out primarily from the Prime Minister's exposure to certain expertise from within our region that has recommended a completely different approach to this issue of violence within our society. The Prime Minister has discussed this with his peers, other heads of government, and at the last CARICOM head of government conference in the Bahamas, a mandate was given to Trinidad and Tobago to convene a regional forum at which this approach can be considered, distilled, and specific decisions can be made. And that's exactly what happened over the last two days, Monday and Tuesday of this week. Um, and it really was a, quite an experience where a range of experts from across CARICOM and outside of CARICOM were brought together with key policymakers, a, a number of heads of government, uh, a number of key government ministers, including attorney general, the commissioners of police of several of our of key jurisdictions, uh, sectoral leaders, and a range of individuals, stakeholders on this issue were brought into the same space. There was the, the presentation of evidence, of research, of recommendations. There were uh, panels where these issues were discussed in detail. A uh, declaration has been formulated, which is more on the political level, where heads are uh, expressing this uh, renewed commitment coming out of the symposium. And a plan of action has been drafted and is being finalized even as we speak. So a lot has happened in, in, in over the last two, two days. And the point was made before the symposium. I made the point that this forum is not an end in itself. It's not a cure for crime. But it really is the beginning of a fresh approach, which is exactly what our people across
across the region have been demanding, and which is what they deserve. So this issue of crime, of a public health approach to violent crime, is not a new one, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a bit new for us in terms of its application. Mm -hmm. uh, the, from the World Health Organization, the CDC, and the range of other bodies that are focused on health have recommended such an approach to treating with seemingly intractable social issues. This has been a roundup of some of the stories following the regional symposium addressing crime and violence as a public health issue. I'm DK Rossa. Thank you for tuning in to TTT.